Hello and welcome to another Imperator Rome Developer Diary. This time we're going to be talking a little bit about Epirus, so how about we just dive right in. So, greetings fellow Epirates, I hope you're ready for a long bescreenshotted dev diary. I do like bescreenshotted dev diaries, and also long dev diaries. Uh, that, that suits me down to the ground, thank you, yes. Uh, that's right, today I'll be talking a little about the three new mission trees included in the re-release of the Epirus pre-order pack and the history that inspired them. Only three, I hear you say, fear not, they're chock full of flavour and tasks. The decades preceding our start date were rather turbulent for Epirus, with the two main branches of the ruling Aesead dynasty, supposedly direct descendants of the hero Achilles and named for his grandfather Aesius. I have no idea if I'm pronouncing those correctly, but I'm going to go with probably perfectly. Fighting each other for the throne and being picked off uh, by wars in Italy and Macedon. Um, so nothing changed up until Pyrrhus's death then. Because that's kind of exactly what happened to Pyrrhus as well. Uh, he, he got picked off by wars in Italy, uh, not so much with Macedon, but maybe a little bit. And then he died in, in Sparta from a roof tile. So uh, rip him, I guess. Pyrrhus was himself forced to flee to neighbouring Taulantia as an infant when his father Achates was deposed by the dominant Molossian tribe, under encouragement from Cassander in Macedon, who installed Achates' older brother Alcatas in his place along with the Macedonian governor. While his son was living in exile, Achates, I, I again, again these names, uh, was killed fighting the forces of Cassander in support of the claims of his ill-fated cousin Olympias' descendants. Right, lovely. Uh, and then we can see here that um, Paris is going to have the blood of Iacos. So we're going to get uh, plus five percent morale of armies if your uh, if your ruler has this bloodline. It is only patrilineal, same as the other bloodlines, other than Aegeid. Um Bit of popularity gain as well. Extra bit of martial. So I guess uh, probably Paris is going to start off a little bit more martially capable, which is nice. Iacos was the grandfather of the greatest Greek hero, Achilles, and king of the island of Aegina in the Saronic Gulf. Neoptolemus, son of Achilles, came to be king of the Molossian Epirates after he returned from the Trojan War, and his descendants have ruled ever since, uniting Epirus and contributing to the legacy of Alexander the Great through his mother Olympias. Very cool. By 304 BC, so the start date, Paris had been reinstalled on the throne by the Taulantian king Glaucius after Alcatas II was deposed and killed. You may see a trend developing. Well, yeah, considering what we know about, you know, what they said about the previous, you know, history of Epirus and now the future of Epirus, we obviously know. Uh, yeah, there is a trend. Uh, history doesn't repeat, but it does sort of rhyme. His main rival is his second cousin, Neoptelemus, who is arguably a more deserving claimant, being the son of Alexander the second, sorry, the first of Epirus, and daughter of Cleopatra of Macedon, Alexander the Great's only full sibling, thereby making him both an Argeid and an Aesid. Oh, does he actually have both bloodlines? That would be pretty cool. Historically, Pyrrhus was deposed once again and replaced by Neoptelemus in an event chain which owners of the pre-order DLC will already be familiar with. Yes, and then Pyrrhus goes to uh, live with Antigonus for a while, sending him to the Diatoki courts where he seeks support for his claim on Epirus's throne. Historically, he went to the Antigonids, uh, yeah, and he even fought in the uh, Battle of Ipsus, as Demetrius of Polyocrates had recently married his sister Diademia and fought with their military before ending up in the Ptolemaic court as part of the hostage negotiations after the Battle of Issus. You've, you've, you've spelled it wrong, it's Ipsus. It's not Issus, whatever. The new missions allow you to organize, unless that's another battle that happened after the Battle of Ipsus that I am unaware of. That could also be the case. Um, the new missions allow you to organize a royal marriage with any of the successor kingdoms, thereby guiding which court Paris flees to if he is deposed and thus the marriage and support he may acquire while away. Lovely stuff. So you can uh, marry the Seleucids, you can probably still marry the Antigonids, Ptolemies, um, Soters, that's it. Yeah, so probably that would be uh, pretty good. I doubt the uh, Seleucids would help 
too terribly much, considering they have to get through Epir uh, the Antigonids to get to Epirus. Uh, but we'll see. Uh, the old event arranging an Antigonid Aeacid marriage will still fire as usual for non-DLC owners. Paris's return to Epirus works much as before, though some new events will detail the continued rivalry between Neoptalmus, or whoever is the most eligible pretender, and Pyrrhus, leading to a violent resolution and the ascendance of the favoured prince. Lovely stuff, get some stability, lose a little bit of legitimacy, uh, Neoptalmus gets killed. Um, I wonder if he's going to have a kid first so you can get that lovely Aegead bloodline as well. Um, the first mission tree, Molossian Consolidation, is centered around the politics, development, and minor expansions of the realm under Neoptalmus and earlier on in Pyrrhus' time on the throne. The king-making power of the Molossians will still need to be checked by the new monarch, and there are plenty of opportunities for expanding the Pantheon, developing Epirus' core territories, and deciding how to deal with your northern, western, and southern neighbors. Very nice. Uh, so we've got some stuff here, Talantian Diplomacy, Talantia being obviously the purple pinky one there. Royal Wedding is probably the one we've saw above where you choose who to marry with. Um, very cool, okay. And uh, then we've got Macedonian Lessons, Adriatic Colonies, expanding the Royal Kennels, all right. Uh, as the eagle eyes have already spotted, Epirus no longer owns Ambrachia from the start. Oh yeah, so they don't. Um, which is now an OPM and tributary of Macedon alongside Arcarnia. Oh wow. That makes Epirus' start a lot more difficult. Because usually, like, my opening move as Epirus is to fight against Arcarnia. Because they'll bring in uh, the likes of Boeotia and the nation that is just south of of the strait um which i forgot the name of and it's it's a way for you to get into the peloponnese very very easily and start getting a few vassals and then use those vassals to take on macadon if acarnia is no longer an option that's rough that is incredibly rough actually because they're one of the only one of the only little Greek dudes that aren't a tributary or guaranteed or client of one of the Diadochi. That's rough. That's very rough. Um, but you need not fret. Epirus is no weaker than it was before. Mm. And there will be an opportunity to claim the territory without bloodshed as your campaign develops. Okay, well that's, that's decent. That's good at least. But at the same time, ouch. Um, ooh, what's this? The true weather of the soul. Tragedy has once again struck Macedon, with the uncertainty of succession has put the remaining two eldest sons, Cassandra and Alexandros, into a bitter struggle for the throne. Alexandros the Younger is forced to take up arms against his elder brother, and has now arrived at our court requesting assistance in the conflict. In exchange for our help, Alexandros has promised to grant us subjugated Ambracian and Acarnian territories on our southern border with Macedon. If that's an event fire, if that looks like an event fired revolt, because I generally don't see, you know, revolts this size come. I would love to see it, though. Um, if you have two sons and they would, like, fight each other, that would be pretty cool. Uh, the above is part of one of a number of free minor dynamic historical events. Coming with a 1.5 patch to add a little bit more historical flavor to Macedon and the fraught Antipatrids. I want this event not specifically, you know... You know, not Pyrrhus, but I want this event for all monarchies. You've got two sons, they don't like each other, and, uh, you know, the, their dad dies and they want to go to war with each other, so the younger one will go to a rival's court and say, I need your help. Maybe, obviously, you don't need to give away territory for it, but go give us help and then maybe at the end of it you'll get an alliance with them or whatever that would be really really bloody cool and i really really want it so much so much it shouldn't just be for macadon it really shouldn't there are also a few extra flavor events for Paris outside of the missions that feature some of the events of his life and those who affected it which can have some 
ahistoric outcomes. As usual, Pyrrhus bravely led his army from the front, riding into the thick of the action with his bodyguard. Yes, because he thought he was Alexander Reborn. But today it seems he was singled out by a determined foe wishing to gain glory by slaying such a prestigious figure. Discarding the advice of his guard and generals, Pyrrhus paid little heed to the ravening Italian bearing down on him until it was too late. Pyrrhus's horse was ran through by the Frentanian spear just at the moment his own bodyguard returned to the favour, hacking the man to pieces while the king was carried to safety. So, I guess it's uh, Pythia that saves him, he gains a bit of martial, and he becomes friends with him, makes sense. Definitely makes sense. Also, this guy's face is weird. So, Alexandrine ambition. Now, Pyrrhus is, of course, most famous for his campaigns in Italy, inspired by those of his cousin Alexander I of Epirus, who died fighting the Brutians and Lucanians, and was himself attempting to emulate his nephew Alexander the Great's eastern conquests in the west. However, Pyrrhus was famously acratic, changing his objectives on a whim and pursuing many simultaneous opportunities. To reflect this, Epirus will be able to change between the two other mission trees, Alexander and Britian and Hellenic Contender, without a cooldown or loss of progress while Pyrrhus is the ruler, though at a cost to the court's confidence in their leader. That's pretty cool. It's a nice way of uh, showing how ADHD he was. I, I guess that's what Akratic means. It's ancient ADHD. Yeah. The Alexandrine Ambition Mission Tree offers opportunities to involve yourself in the wars of Magna Graecia by aiding the Greek city-states against Italic aggressors. Seek revenge for the defeats of your dynasty and perhaps even achieve glorious victory over the Romans and Carthaginians, thereby cementing your position as hegemon of the West. Very nice. And we'll see what we've got here. Benevolent moves around the cities, Italian leadership. Yeah, this is going into... Italy and then obviously into um, Carthage as well. Very nice. Pax Eprum. Nice. Love it. Very cool. Historically, Paris used his reputation as a great warrior, the threat of the Italic and Punic powers, and the renowned skills of his diplomat Cineus to win over the Greek city-states and be appointed to lead their forces. This tree will allow you to gain Italian and Sicilian subjects and alliances in a similar manner. Though, as Pyrrhus found, failing to live up to your ambitions in a timely manner may undermine your diplomatic efforts. It was less that he didn't live up to his ambitions, and more that he decided, Ooh, I can go over here instead and do this thing instead. Oh, I want to go to Sicily. Fuck my Italian allies. Oh, I want to go back to Sparta. Fuck my Sicilian allies. ADHD, definitely. Over time, the Italic... Italiot cities... Fall into decadence, valuing a comfortable life above all else, and neglecting their own defence, content to have others fight their wars for them. Now Tyrus is under attack from the growing Roman tribe who wishes to supplant the Hellenic position in Magna Graecia. So you become the feudatory overlord and declare war on Rome. Proclaiming ourselves the foil to Rome, may acquire as Hellenistic subjects or Italic allies. Very nice. Uh, and then Calcitrants. Our Italian subjects have been growing more and more disgruntled, decrying our leadership methods as harsh and raging at our forced recruitment of their citizens. Their leaders are now convinced that opposition to our rule is the only way to remain in power, and point to our failure to unite the region. It will be hard to keep these cities in line. Native 15 loyalties. It's pretty manageable, actually. It's, it's not that terrible. In seeking dominance over Magna Graecia, Epirus will undoubtedly come into contact with one of the nascent Italian powers, be it Rome or some other, and may attempt to negotiate a truce, an offer the Romans famously turned down after the condemnation of the Appius Claudius Sasus, or simply triumph over the barbarians, as Pyrrhus so perically failed to do. Diplomats from Epirus, the Greek invaders of southern Italia, led by a man named Cineus, have arrived to treat with us, lamenting our differences. Cineus exhorts our assembly that common ground may be found and peace maintained with both Etruscan and Epirate interests preserved. Many of our senators seem won over by the words of this sophist, that is, until Carcuna is brought to the chamber and gives a scathing and rousing speech, decrying their cowardice. So this is if uh, Etruria wrecks Rome, I guess. It would be possible to create two large vassals, one in Magna Graecia and one in Sicily, once dominance is achieved in either. Of course, this is optional, and Epirus may wish to rule the region more directly, as you generally would. Although that is a fairly interesting colour. Not exactly Magna Graecian purple, after all. 
Client state of Magnagration. Oh, it's a client state as well. Blah. No, never. Never, never, never. Cicalia as well. It's, it's okay. All of these tasks acquire their targets dynamically and do not depend on the survival of any specific tags, for example, Rome. Of course, historically, Pyrrhus failed to hold on to his holdings in Greece, despite a wide coalition of Greeks and Italics aiding him, uh, the Ro aiding him against the Romans, and he ultimately gave up his holdings in the face of defeat and turned his attention to Macedon and Greece with his characteristic determined impatience. Um, as relatives of Alexander the Great, the Aikidae, the Aikidae, may attempt to claim the throne of Macedon and supplant the northerners as the hegemons of Greece, using the argument that Macedonian's greatest conqueror owed his qualities to his Epirate mother as much as his Argead father. That's fair. Uh, though the skeptics are numerous, Pyrrhus has put forward his claim to the throne of Macedon. He is legitimate heir through Alexander the Great's mother, Olympias, who was killed by Cassandros when he seized the throne of Macedon. Taking the Aegean throne will provide a legitimate successor for Alexander's empire and avenge the ravages of the Antipatrids. I completely agree. Definitely. If I'm if I'm playing as Pyrrhus, definitely forming Macedon is, is high on the list of things I would like to do. Um, yeah, I would definitely do that. Uh, Agia Claim got Alexander's throne. Where else is this bringing us? Thessaly, liberate Thessaly. Fair enough. Nice. Epirus may attempt, as Pyrrhus did historically with Lysimachus of Thrace, to form a pact of expedients with one of the Diadochi against Macedon and thereby surround them on both sides. For only 25 ducats? Hell yeah. Um, that seems decent. Uh, Epirus will be able to liberate the subjugated Thessalians, whose general Menon of Pharsalus was the father of Pyrrhus's mother, Pythia, and fell fighting Polyperchon and Antipater for the Thessalians' freedom after Alexander the Great's death, thereby making use of their famed cavalry as his companions. And he'll get Thessalian retinue for discipline and offence. That doesn't say for how long, though it's better than the Spartan Thessalian cav. Uh, that's nice. I, I would love to get that forever. Client state. Ugh. The Aikidae may also turn the shrine of Achilles at Troy into a major cult center by taking control of the city, thereby bringing the hero of the Iliad and dynasty into Epirus's state pantheon. Uh, it, Troy is in the game? No, it's Ilian. Okay. I was going to say, Troy isn't actually a named territory in the game so it'd be nice if uh, doing this actually renamed Ilian to Troy that'd be pretty cool at last our modest temple is complete and has been inaugurated with a lavish festival in Achilles' honor complete with games and martial competitions the slopes of the Ilian uh, will forever be remembered as the site of the greatest feats of the Greeks and their foremost warrior Aspetos buried alongside his lover Patroclos very nice tomb of Achilles will be moved from Epirus to Ilian oh, I like it I like it a lot. Okay. Ultimately, Paris was killed after a campaign in Greece that began with an invasion of Sparta, which he sought to install a puppet claimant on their throne, a gambit which Epirus can attempt against any monarchy in Greece, for which the Spartan defense is remembered for its bravery in the face of overwhelming odds and uh, a roof tile. Our agents have successfully identified a number of ongoing disputes in the monarchies of Greece, or failing that, found willing unnotable relatives willing to claim a throne with spurious juristic, uh, sorry, justification. It's time we decide which chariot we want to back, depending on the current political situation. So Sparta Thieves, Megalopolis, Korkira. Sparta is obviously going to be the the most valuable one of those, I would say. Also, that flag. Oh, yes. Yellow Macedon, black flag. You know what? I'm, I'm, I'm game. That, that I love it. Yellow Macadon, a little bit less loving it, but the flag is gorgeous. Yes. So, if you get Alexander's throne, we have succeeded in reclaiming the throne of Alexander the Great in Pella, the heart of the Macedonian kingdom, and vanquished the false successor kingdom of Cassandrus. Back under Epirot leadership, the greatness of Macadon can finally be realized once again. Uh, Epirus changes name to Macadon, Pella becomes the capital... Pelagains, Aikadid, Argid, Capital, yes, yes, yes. So you no longer change your primary culture to Macedonian. That is interesting. That is very interesting. 
because forming Makedon as Epirus actually changed your culture to Macedonian in the uh, in the current patch. Very cool. Uh, also, I forgot this. Uh, most importantly, there are two new loading screen quotes related to Pyrrhus, so keep your eyes peeled for the come release day. Really? Quotes? I saw loading screen, and I'm like, yay, and then just, just piss and quote. It's probably going to be something like, um, if we win another battle like this, we're finished. I think that's the quote. Despite his ultimate defeat and death during the Siege of Argos, Pyrrhus's exploits had a great impact on the world, only narrowly being cheated out of the dominion of Magna Graecia and Macedon by fortune and the fates. With a little more prudence, Pyrrhus, legendary even in defeat, can outshine even the glory of Alexander. Yep, well, if you're if you're going to be playing as him, definitely that is going to be the goal. Let's see if there are any dev responses to uh, the dev diary. Um, I never pre-ordered, so thanks for releasing the pack for us to get. What is the scheme political marriage do, and how do you access that screen? In 1.5, you can ask the heads of your great families for a spouse from among their relatives outside of court. Oh my god, this is the... This should have been in the dev diary. This is, this is huge. Families themselves will also do this to each other. It is, however, not intended to be able to seek one for your dead relatives, which is a bug. Right, but if you're not understanding what this means, it means that... You are able to get a wife, regardless of how many women are in your court. Because quite often, you end up in a situation where you have your ruler, he dies. Your son, you know, takes the throne and he's not married. You need to find him a wife so he can have the babies too. So you go arrange marriage and you've got three or four options all of whom are over 50 years old and therefore can't have children. And you're fucked. And the way that I personally work around that now is I uh, go into the character menu, sort by female and from youngest to oldest, find someone who is about to come of age and favorite them. However, you don't get a notification when they come of age. They often end up being forgotten until after they've already married someone else. Uh, like a couple of months after after they become of age so being able to just like you know okay i need a marriage pause the game talk to your great families give me a woman boom done married awesome perfect i love this 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 is like the biggest this is the biggest uh piece of information in this dev diary i mean this is cool this is better Fantastic. Does it come any benefits or drawbacks? Say choosing the option for the head of family gains you some loyalty at the expense of your other families. There are a few different outcomes. Nothing is set in stone in this world. They could even refuse, though their head of family would have to be quite disloyal for this. Generally, marrying your ruler or heir into another family will make them quite happy and will help with their loyalty, but it could well make other families upset since they were passed over. You have control over which family you ask when you start the scheme. Refusing the match they find for you will also not endear them to you. Okay, so it does, does upsides and drawbacks. Uh, as there are with everything, but yeah, I'm this, this here, this here is, mwah, oh, so good, so, so good, uh, but I would love to know what you guys think, so let me know in the comment section below uh, what your thoughts are about uh, Epirus, about the, the missions that we have been shown, um, I'd love to know your thoughts, I know mission trees can be a little bit divisive, um, but I, I, I'm okay, I'm okay with them, I, I quite like them, um, yeah, but that's, uh, that's the dev diary, and, uh, yeah, it was okay, still, I think the best part of it was that one little thing in the dev comments, it's like, that should have been, like, front and center, that's what people have been begging for for ages, so good, also, this flag is gorgeous, uh, but anyway, yeah, let me know what you guys think in the comment section below, will you be playing as Epirus when 1.5 drops, let me know, like the video, subscribe if you want to see more Imperative Rome news and updates, and I will see you guys in the next one. Bye-bye.